On a rainy night, bank robber Frank Morris was escorted to this Accra prison where no one could escape due to multiple escapes. Due to his history of escape attempts and his high level of intelligence, Frank Morris underwent a thorough body search to ensure he did not carry any prohibited items. He was then locked in a cell through several electronically controlled doors. At that time, Yakala Prison was the most strictly managed prison in the United States, with an average of one guard for every three inmates. To prevent any incidents of violence, even eating noodles was only allowed with a spoon, as forks were not provided. On the first day, a big man provoked the newly arrived Frank Morris. The bespectacled uncle sat with Frank Morris during mealtime. He secretly kept a pet mouse. Frank Morris shared his noodles with the bespectacled uncle, and they became friends. After breakfast, Warden Arthur Dollison called Frank Morris into his office. He explained the rules of the prison to him and warned him not to entertain any thoughts of escape. He made it clear that those who attempted to escape were either shot or drowned. No prisoner had ever escaped from Alcatraz alive. Without saying a word, Frank Morris discreetly pocketed Arthur Dollison's nail file. Uncle Blasses washed his little pet while taking a bath. The big man from earlier took the opportunity to provoke Frank Morris in the morning. In response, Frank Morris fiercely hammered him and shoved a bar of soap into his mouth. Shortly after, Frank Morris was called to the library to assist. There, he meets the library clerk, is serving two consecutive sentences of 99 years for killing two people in a bar. He had attempted to escape in the past but failed. During recreation time, Frank Morris noticed a prisoner drawing and asked him about the flower on his chest. The artist claimed to be a doctor and explained that the chrysanthemum symbolized freedom and hope. Also reminded Frank Morris to be careful of the revenge of the big man. Mr. Black, Frank Morris can be seen observing security at the prison. Tell him that not only the warning here is twice that of a regular prison, but all the doors and windows are reinforced with iron bars and cannot be sawn off. The prison's underground is a solid rock, making tunneling impossible. The only way to leave the island is through the water. Although the nearest shore is only 2 miles away, the water current is turbulent, and the highest water temperature is around 10 degrees Celsius. Within a few minutes, it would make a person's arms numb and drain their strength. Even a skilled swimmer would not be able to swim across. In addition, the prison conducts roll calls 12 times a day, and even changing the time for using the restroom requires permission. Escaping is extremely difficult. The next day, a big man came with a weapon to seek revenge on Frank Morris, but Frank Morris, who was prepared in advance, beat him up. The prison guards tried to stop him but were scratched by the big man. It was not until a guard in the tower fired a gunshot that the big man stopped. Despite being on the defensive, Frank Morris was still thrown into the solitary confinement cell, just like the big man. Every day, the prison guards tortured the inmates in the solitary confinement cell with high-pressure water guns, claiming it was for cleaning purposes. After several days, Frank Morris finally returned to his cell, mentally distraught from the torture. Uncle I sent his little mouse to send a note with warm greetings. Next to Frank Morris, a new inmate named Charlie Butts arrived, and Frank Morris took the initiative to build a relationship with him. One day, Arthur Dollison accidentally discovered a portrait of himself drawn by a doctor. The portrait was incredibly lifelike, but the next day, Arthur Dollison found a reason to permanently deprive the doctor of his drawing privileges. Simply because he disliked the chrysanthemum symbolizing freedom in the artwork. The doctor, who lost his right to draw, seemed to have lost his soul. The prison provided inmates with woodworking opportunities to earn some pocket money. In protest against the deprivation of his rights, the doctor chopped off his own right finger in the woodworking room. Prison guards were frightened to the ground. Frank Morris took out something the doctor had placed in his pocket and discovered a bright yellow chrysanthemum. He knew that the doctor was encouraging him to escape from there. At night, a cockroach crawled in through the ventilation shaft in the cell. This small detail immediately caught Frank Morris' attention. He turned off the lights and effortlessly chipped away the crumbling cement from the wall using a nail file. It turned out that the prison had aged over time, and the damp air had caused the once sturdy structure to develop vulnerabilities. The next day, Frank Morris unexpectedly encountered his old friends, the Anglin brothers. These two brothers had served their sentence with Frank Morris before, and due to a failed escape attempt, they were also imprisoned here. During recreation time, Frank Morris was chatting with his cellmate, Charlie Butts. A prison guard approached Charlie Butts and informed him that someone had come to visit him. It was his girlfriend, who informed Charlie Butts that his mother was critically ill and nearing death. She expressed her love for him with great affection. Back in the cell, Charlie Butts immediately decided to join Frank Morris in his escape plan. So at dinner the next day, Frank Morris officially explained to Charlie Butts and Anglin brothers that he had a way to escape from prison. 
The plan involved expanding the ventilation shaft to escape the cell and then using the roof to get out of the prison. Finally, they would use raincoats and cement glue to create life vests and escape suits to leave the island. The four men unanimously agreed to proceed. That night, Frank Morris used a nail file to dig through the ventilation shaft. Charlie Butts was responsible for lookout duty, but the nail file was not efficient, and his hand became sore from digging for too long. So, Frank Morris had an idea. He noticed the spoons used for meals and deliberately made them dirty. Then, Frank Morris told the guard that the spoon was dirty and requested a replacement. Approaching the cutlery table, the Anglin brothers took the opportunity to distract the guard's attention, allowing Frank Morris to successfully take two spoons. When the librarian delivered magazines, Frank Morris asked how to weld two pieces of metal together in the ballroom. The librarian asked him whether he was going to dig holes or kill people, and Frank Morris answered honestly. The librarian smiled slightly. He has been in the library all day and has seen a lot. He really has a way. So, Frank Morris traded his dessert with Uncle Eyeball for a coin. He then collected a bundle of matches, broke the spoons, and used the wrong side of the nail file to scrape off some powder from the coin. He applied the powder to the joint between the spoon and the nail file and ignited a match to burn it. This way, the two pieces of metal were firmly welded together. Indeed, with this, digging the hole became much more convenient. Some of the debris from the digging was flushed down the toilet, while the rest was discreetly discarded during recreation time. However, the iron grill on the ventilation shaft was welded shut, requiring a wooden wedge with stripped bark from a woodworking project to pry it open. It couldn't pass through the metal detector with it. When the work shift ended, Frank Morris triggered the metal detector as he came out, holding the wooden wedge, claiming he needed to go back and make a clothes hanger. The guard refused and confiscated the wooden wedge. Little did they know that Frank Morris had another one hidden in his shoe this method was truly ingenious. With the wooden wedge, Frank Morris kicked down the iron grill with his feet, making no noise. He then stuck his head into the ventilation shaft, finding a narrow passage filled with pipes. Using a mirror, he observed the patrol patterns of the guards. The patrols were too frequent, so in order to enter the space behind the ventilation shaft, they would need to deceive the guards. So Frank Morris started making fake vents and fake heads out of magazines and dirt. Then he handed the digging tools to the other three individuals to open the ventilation holes, and Charlie Butts requested painting tools. Meanwhile, Frank Morris collected hair of the same color as his own during recreation time. In the evening, Charlie Butts handed the paintbrush and flesh-colored paint to Frank Morris. Frank Morris painted the fake ventilation holes and painted the dummy heads to match the flesh color. Finally, he stuck the collected hair on top, stuffed clothes inside the blanket, creating a lifelike appearance in the dimly lit cell. Then he crawled through the ventilation hole into the back passage to explore, and the patrolling guards did not notice anything unusual. Frank Morris climbed all the way to the top floor and discovered that the ventilation hole leading to the rooftop was welded shut, and he couldn't reach it alone. The guards made several rounds of patrols and noticed that Frank Morris remained motionless, not even waking up when his own baton fell to the ground. Curious, he reached out and touched Frank Morris's head. It turned out that Frank Morris intentionally remained motionless to deceive the guards. On the Anglin brothers' side, things were going well. They were working in the warehouse and had started stealing raincoats and cement glue one by one. A few months later, one of the Anglin brothers climbed up to the top floor with Frank Morris and spread the stolen raincoats on it. This served both as a convenience for their escape and prevented the raincoats from being discovered in their cells. Because the top floor usually has no one going there or patrolling it. The two worked together to dig out the steel bars of the vent, and found that there was an iron cover riveted to the iron column inside. The steel bars can be broken by removing an iron pipe in the channel, but removing the rivets requires a flashlight and an electric drill. However, being in prison, it was impossible for them to have these two items. But Frank Morris had a high level of intelligence and found a small fan on top of the piano in the music room. When they were about to leave, Frank Morris directly put the fan into his instrument case. Coincidentally, a guard decided to inspect the cases. Charlie Butts became frightened upon hearing this, but Frank Morris confidently said, check mine. The guard, seeing Frank Morris's proactive response, ended up inspecting Charlie Butts's case instead. This allowed Frank Morris to keep the small fan. He dismantled the fan blades, keeping only the motor. Exchange desserts for drills and wires stolen by Uncle I. The Anglin brothers also managed to obtain a small lamp by dismantling an iron pipe. Frank Morris hung upside down and used the iron pipe to pry apart the reinforced bars. There happened to be a socket nearby for equipment installation. Frank Morris starts breaking rivets with a power drill. During a movie screening, Charlie Butts expressed concern about being discovered, as the paper-made ventilation hole was becoming worn out. 
Frank Morris suggested using cement to secure the edges of the ventilation hole. That day, Arthur Dollison was inspecting the cafeteria and saw Frank Morris watering and moisturizing a chrysanthemum flower. Dollison became enraged and directly crushed the flower with his hand. This caused Eyeglass, another inmate, to have a heart attack and die on the spot. However, Arthur Dollison showed no concern. Mockingly, he remarked that some people were destined to stay in Yakala prison forever, and then he walked away after tossing the crushed flower. On Sunday evening, when the librarian delivered magazines, Frank Morris didn't say his usual see you but instead said goodbye. This made the librarian realize that he was bidding farewell, so they shook hands for the last time. Arthur Dollison, feeling uneasy, conducted a thorough search of Frank Morris's cell. He even took away the instrument case blocking the ventilation hole. However, unfortunately, he didn't realize that the ventilation hole was fake. After coming out, Warden Arthur Dollison heard from the prison guard that Frank talked a lot with Charlie Butts. So he asked the guards to separate the two, but it would take two days at the fastest to change the cell. Frank Morris didn't know about the cell change, but the big guy, who had been in solitary confinement for six months, was causing trouble again. While Frank Morris wasn't afraid of fighting the big man, he worried that getting involved in a fight and being sent to solitary confinement would disrupt his escape plan. So he decides to break out tonight, avoiding Arthur Dollison's plan to change cells. Clearly, the big man couldn't wait for revenge any longer. Fortunately, Mr. Black noticed the big guy carrying a weapon and took him away. Frank Morris saw Uncle Glass's mouse that night, so he put the mouse in his pocket and took it out of prison together. The prison guards passed by Frank Morris's cell and still didn't notice anything unusual. However, Charlie Butts, on the other hand, was overly nervous and hesitated to take action. Frank Morris could only leave with the Anglin brothers because any further delay would jeopardize everyone's escape. Frank Morris climbed from the ventilation hole on the top floor to the rooftop and lifted the iron cover that was placed on top. The iron cover fell to the ground, making a noise that caught the attention of the tower guard, who turned on the searchlight to investigate. Fortunately, Frank Morris didn't emerge right away, and the guard didn't pay much attention, completely unaware that someone was attempting to escape. Then the three climbed up to the roof one after another from the ventilation pipe, took the kayak and life jackets made in advance with raincoats and began to retreat. They reached a corner of the rooftop, put on the life jackets, and slowly descended through the pipes to the next floor. Then, they took turns climbing over two iron meshes in a blind spot of surveillance. Meanwhile, Charlie Butts finally decided to take action, but the cement had dried, blocking the hole. After breaking through the cement and drilling in with great difficulty, he found himself on the top floor without any help from his teammates, making it impossible for him to reach the rooftop on his own. Frank Morris and his two companions successfully crossed the iron fence and ran all the way to the dock, reaching the seaside from the side of the bridge. They deployed their homemade rescue valve, began blowing with their mouths, and swam towards Angel Island next door. The next day, Charlie Butts stood early in front of the prison cell door. The prison guard was about to transfer Frank Morris as per Arthur Dollison's orders, but no matter how they tried to wake him up, he wouldn't respond. The prison guard became furious and tried to forcibly lift him up, only to see a round, rolling head falling to the ground. The prison guard was shocked and quickly blew the whistle, signaling a prison break. The librarian chuckled upon hearing the alarm. Subsequently, all the prison guards mobilized their forces to thoroughly search the prison, even deploying helicopters, speedboats, and even warships. However, they only found photos of the Anglin brothers and a notebook. On a rocky reef, Arthur Dollison discovered a chrysanthemum, a blatant mockery of himself. Arthur Dollison insisted that the escaped prisoners had drowned. But with no sign of their bodies, nobody knows whether Frank Morris and his two companions successfully escaped or not.